you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, and I want us to read together the first 11 verses. John chapter 2. And if you're able and willing to stand, then I'll invite you to please stand in honor of the public reading of God's Word. John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1 and reading down through verse 11. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Father, this morning... As we are confronted by the living Christ with his age-old question, what do you want? Some of us have to answer like Mary, I want the need met. That's all well and good, provided we understand what the real need is. So may you, Father, on this day, by your Spirit, And through your word, teach us what our real need is, our need of a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And may we, like his first disciples, believe in him. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. In this season of the year, we're journeying through John's gospel, tracking a theme. Jesus' first words that he speaks in the gospel of John are a question, an interrogative. Jesus asks the question of the two disciples of John, Andrew and his nameless friend, what do you want? Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus has encounters with people, or we might more aptly say he is encountered by people. People who come with an agenda, people who come with expectations, people who come with needs or concerns, things that they want to know, things that they want to receive, things that they want to be. And of all of them, Jesus asks this question, what do you want? Oh, we may not use those exact words, but in some way, in his way of relating to them, Jesus is asking that question and he's turning their expectations on their heads. He does that of you. and He does that of me. Because every one of us comes to Jesus Christ with an agenda, with a motivation. There's something that drives us to him. There's something we're seeking from him. There's something we want to know about him. There's something that we expect. And in order for us to have a right relationship with Him, in order for us to have true communion, true fellowship with Christ, in order for us to really be His disciples, He must first break down that barrier. He must first pull down that shade. He must first show us what it is that we want or expect from Him so that He can then show us what our real need is. So that He can then Show us what he expects from us so that we might actually be his disciples and have eternal life in him. 
See, John is writing with a motive, with an intent. He says that as plainly in John 20 and 31 where he says that these things are written. All of these things, all these stories, all these accounts, all these, these interactions that Jesus has with his disciples. All these things are written so that you, the reader, the hearer, might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing, you might have life in his name. So it's our prayer that as we journey through John's gospel, every week asking the question, what do you want? That you would come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing, have life in his name. The first miracle that Jesus performs, the first of his signs, John tells us, was a miracle of turning water into wine at Cana in Galilee at a wedding. We all know the story if we're familiar with the scriptures. We've heard this since we were children in Sunday school. Perhaps we have focused on the miracle itself and that is certainly one of the major thrusts of this passage. Maybe we have focused in on the disciples and their response or the nature of the servants and their service to Christ and what they learned by being in his presence. But this morning I want us to Examine it first from the perspective of the mother of Jesus, Mary. Mary came to Jesus with a problem, a predicament, a situation. And like he did with those two disciples of John the Baptist, he more or less said, what do you want, Mary? You see, they had been invited to a wedding and in the first century, in the culture of, of the Jews of Palestine, of ancient Israel, there was a custom that you didn't turn down an invitation to a wedding. This was a significant thing. It wasn't that Jesus and his mother were particularly close to the host of this wedding. They didn't need to be. They might have just been acquaintances. They might have just known one another. They might have passed by each other as their villages were near each other. More or less, though, they were expected to go. Mary and Jesus had been invited, and because Jesus was invited, the custom of the day meant that his disciples were invited as well. Only as soon as they show up into these wedding festivities, a problem arises. Mary comes to Jesus and she said, there's no more wine. Now, can we just not focus on the wine for a moment? I know that bothers some of us. We are Baptists after all. We like to toe the line and we want to say, well, you know, this is, maybe this wasn't really wine. Maybe it was like Welch's. It wasn't Welch's. They didn't have Welch's. <laughs> Sometimes we say, well, it was watered down. They drank wine to deal with the water. Actually, they had pretty good water sources in Judea. It was wine. It was what it was. So let's just not focus on that for a moment. You know, let's not be like that woman. I know y'all heard about the woman. They were having a temperance meeting in the church and talking about the need to really stand against alcohol. And there was a woman who was railing against uh, alcohol and the consumption of alcohol. And she just was going off. And somebody said, I think it was probably a young preacher, he said, well, well what about Jesus? He turned water into wine. And she said, yeah, I'd have thought a lot more of him if he hadn't have done that too. <laughs> Some of us get that way. Let's not. Let's not do that. Let's not go that far. Let's let it be what it is. Jesus was presented with a problem. That in a culture where wine was a symbol of celebration, it was a custom, it was a part of the life of the people, for the host of a wedding feast to run out of wine was a major social faux pas. It was a disgrace. And Mary, because she's a woman and she would have been able to know what was going on in the kitchen. The women always know what's going on in the kitchen, by the way. Even when the men are in the kitchen, they know what's going on in the kitchen. But because Mary was a woman and she would have had privy to what was going on behind the scenes, she would have discovered early on they're about to run out of wine. And so she comes to her son and presents him with the problem. And when we dig a little deeper, maybe we learn that the reason that Mary comes and presents Jesus with the problem 
is not just because she knows that he is something special, though let's be clear, he is something special. He hasn't demonstrated his wondrous powers yet, not in this way. This is, after all, the first of his signs, but Mary knows that he's the Son of God. Mary knows that he's the Christ. Mary knows that he's the one sent from God to save his people from their sins. Mary has watched this child grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. And Mary was right there when her adolescent son was found in the temple talking with the elders, teaching them with amazing authority. So though she hasn't seen his miraculous power displayed yet, she knows he's got it. He can handle it. But actually if we dig deeper, there's more to the story here. Because probably what Mary is doing in coming to Jesus and saying they ran out of wine, they are about to be disgraced, this is a problem. In coming and presenting the problem to Jesus, what Mary is really doing is saying, hey, you and your disciples, y'all are part of this. Y'all caused this. You see, the host of the banquet, that's the groom's family in their culture, they would have prepared for a specific number of people and they would only have prepared as much wine as would have been needed for the number of days, about seven days of feasting and, uh, and for the number of guests that they would have had. So for extra people to come and be a part of this party, this celebration, this banquet would have caused a little bit of a problem. So Mary, because she knows that this family is about to be disgraced, because she knows that her son's disciples are maybe part of the reason that they've run out early. She comes and lays the problem at his feet. They're out of wine. When Jesus Christ asks of Mary, what does this have to do with me? He's really asking the same question he asked of the two disciples of John the Baptist. What do you want? What do you want, woman? What do you want, mama? What do you want? And if the mother of Jesus Christ had to define what she wanted on that day, at that juncture, what she wanted was for the need to be met. The need that she perceived. The need that was pressing. The need that was most important to the pulling off of this banquet and the saving of this family's reputation. I was reading somewhere online the other day and the comment was made that when women in the South stand around and say, I'm not in charge, that's their way of saying they're doing it wrong. <laughs> and so it was in the hill country of Judea had they run out of wine, there would have been people standing around going, I wasn't in charge. And for years they would have known when that family hosted a party, they ran out. They didn't honor their guests well. They weren't prepared. Mary comes to Jesus and all she wants is for the need of the moment. Have you ever found yourself with such a problem? When you made an assessment of life and its circumstances, you weren't really giving any thought to the mission of the Son of God. You weren't giving any thought to His desire to form you and fashion you according to His image. You weren't really giving any thought to how He could use your situation to further His kingdom and to make disciples of Him. All you really considered, all you really thought about, all you really wondered, would you meet the need of the moment? We've all been there, have we not? In the moment when life is overwhelming, when the circumstances are tragic, when the future seems awfully bleak, we cry out to Jesus Christ and all we want is for Him to take the pain away. All we want is for Him to give healing now. All we want is for Him to provide in abundance. All we want is for our empty stomachs to be filled. All we want is a way where there seems to be no way. 
There aren't many of us, even the maturest among us, who when life circumstances get difficult, start celebrating. There aren't many of us who look on the needs of our lives and say, well, isn't this wonderful? An opportunity to grow. No. We are just like the mother of Jesus. We come to difficult moments. We come to hard circumstances. We come to the times when life gets tough. And what we want is for the need of the moment to be met. And there's only one problem with that. We are often the ones seeking to define You see, brothers and sisters, when we come to Jesus Christ and expect Him to meet the need of the moment without allowing Him to define the need, we misunderstand His mission. To come to Jesus Christ and to say, I need more money. To come to Jesus Christ and say, I need you to fix my relationship with my spouse. To come to Jesus Christ and say, I need a new job. To come to Jesus Christ and say, I need healing is to completely misunderstand his mission. Because he, the Son of God, sent into the world to save sinners from their sins is not a genie in a bottle. Jesus Christ's mission in the world, in your world and in my world, His mission is not to meet every need at every moment as soon as we speak. His mission is to conform us to His image by faith. Jesus Christ is not a cosmic genie that we call upon every time we get in trouble. He is not a savings and loan where we take out a withdrawal every time we come up short. Jesus Christ is not an eternal food pantry who will always set before us a banquet feast. Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came to save sinners from their sins. Brothers and sisters, while Jesus Christ is not indifferent to all the needs of your life and mine, He is insistent upon His will being done. So Mary comes to Jesus. She says, we've got a problem. They have no wine. And Jesus Christ responds to his earthly mother by drawing a line. Did you see that? Did y'all notice the way Jesus talked to his mama? He didn't say, Mama, I don't have time. He didn't say, Mother, not right now. He said, Woman, what does this have to do with me? Now, I'm just going to tell you, where I come from in the panhandle of northwest Florida, you will get slapped for saying something like that. Unless we think that we may read too much into this, this is not a normal way of a son addressing his mother, no matter the culture. It's not really disrespectful. It's not really Jesus insulting her, but it is his way of getting her attention. See, Mary comes to Jesus. And all that Mary knows... All that Mary displays in her interaction with Jesus is that he is her son and she is his mother. And when Jesus Christ says to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? He is drawing a line between them and saying that you need to understand, mama, That yes, you're my mother and yes, I'm your son. But more than that, I'm your savior. And you need to be my disciple. Jesus Christ draws the distinction in order to get Mary's attention. In order to compel her to see that the relationship has to change between them. Because his mission is not just to be a faithful son. It is to be a forgiving savior. So he says, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour 
has not yet come. When Jesus speaks of His hour in the Gospel of John, He is most certainly talking about the hour of His death. All throughout John's Gospel, that word hour is used to relate to the moment, to the time, to the scene of Jesus' sacrifice in the place of sinners. What Jesus is saying to Mary is, is that my mission isn't time, it's not time yet. My, my work in this world of giving my life in the place of sinners, it's not time for that yet. And he understands and Mary understands after this encounter with him that for Jesus to perform this miracle, for Jesus to meet this need is for Jesus to start the clock on the countdown. And so Jesus Christ responds to his mother. Put it in perspective. Mom, see the big picture. You asking me to meet this need. You expecting me to provide in this moment. You wanting me to take away this burden. It seems insignificant to you. It seems easy enough to you. It seems like I can solve it like that for you. But there's more. Jesus says to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And then his mama responds by looking at the servants and saying the unexpected. Do whatever he tells you. What? Whatever he tells you? Mary, did you not get it? He just told you that this was not his Time. He just told you that this was not his custom. He just told you that he's got a bigger agenda at play. You came expecting him to meet the need of the moment and he's trying to get your attention and show you the need of a lifetime and here you are right back to this where you started looking at the servants and saying do whatever he tells you. What's up Mary? And I think what is up is that the mother of Jesus who came in expecting that her son would meet the need walked away resolved that the Savior would display his glory. I think in that moment, Mary interacted with her son. She saw the line drawn in the sand. She came to reckon with the distinction between Jesus, the child that she had nursed and cared for, and Jesus, the man who would give his life in the place of sinners. And when she instructs the servants, do whatever he tells you, it is not an act of defiance. It is not an act of rebellion. It's not Mary's being indifferent to what Jesus has said, but it is paving the way to say whatever you desire, whatever you want, whatever your will, let it be done. Have you given Jesus Christ the room in your life to accomplish His will? Or are you just coming to him with the need of the moment? Saying, give me, teach me, fill me, provide for me. Do you remember the lesson of Jesus himself? Who in the garden on the night before his passion <coughs> prayed to his father for three hours. He prayed the same thing over and over again. Sometimes we think that our repetitions are mindless. They were not mindless in the heart of Jesus. The gospel writers note that he kept praying the same thing. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will, but thine be done. Jesus Christ sets the example for all those who follow him in faith. And that it is that we must make room in our lives for His will to be done. Mary came to Jesus with a problem. They have no wine. And He said, the problem is not that they have no wine. The problem is that you're looking at me like I'm your son who's expected to meet every need. And I'm not just your son. I'm your Savior. 
But there was provision that day. Jesus instructed the servants. Did you notice that? Look there at verse 6. It says, now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn it knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Mary presented a problem and Jesus offered provision. Jesus responds by instructing the servants to take these six stone water jars. They were made out of stone, John notes. Uh, and the significance of that is that they were less prone to becoming impure. Six stone water jars, and that's indicative of the nature of this home, that this was a sizable home, maybe a large family, that they would have these six large water jars that each held between 20 and 30 gallons of water. And the custom was that they would use these jars to wash their hands and to wash their, their, their table elements, their bowls, their utensils. We read the larger context of John 2 and it's indi indicating that probably the Passover is coming up. Maybe these jars are there and in place because they'll soon need to be going through the act of cleansing in preparation for the Passover. Jesus says, take the jars, fill them with water. They filled them to the brim. And then he says, draw some out. Take it to the master of the feast. The master of the feast is probably a guest, someone that they would have appointed to oversee all things, somebody who would have kept the order of the events going, someone who would have made announcements, someone who would have seen that everything was done and in good order. They brought wine to the master of the feast and he tasted the wine and he probably is aware of what they had in stock. He tastes this and he says, wait a minute. This is better than anything we've had all night. I don't know where this came from. So he calls the bridegroom whose family would have been responsible for hosting the banquet. And he says to him, everybody else serves the best first, the worst last. But you kept the best until now. My whole life I have read this story and read right over that as though it were normal. Everybody else serves the best wine first, the poor wine last. You kept the best until first, until last. I have read over that without there being any significance, and it finally hit me this week as I was preparing. Wait a minute. What is the significance that they are serving the best wine last? Well, the significance is that only the master of the feast knows it. Did you see that? When the master of the feast says that everybody serves the good wine first and the poor wine last, he is making a comment on inebriation. He is saying that they give the best first so that by the time they get down to the lesser quality, to the poorer quality wine, everybody is already a little bit intoxicated and they won't know the difference. Jesus Christ has pulled off a miracle. He has turned water into wine and he does not give the poor wine that everybody expects to be served as the banquet goes on. He gives the best that they've had all night. But there's nobody in the wedding party who knows. Everybody else is intoxicated. Everybody else is tipsy. Nobody else besides the master of the feast, the servants who have drawn the water and the disciples of Jesus know what's happened. And as I thought about that, the Lord drew me back to the first chapter of John's gospel and the prologue where John says that he came unto his own, but his own did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, 
He gave the right to become children of God. You see, just like the water being turned to wine and it being the best when everybody is already intoxicated and doesn't know the difference, so Jesus Christ in His incarnation made Himself the best that heaven had to offer known unto a world that was too intoxicated by sin to tell the difference. And yet... To all who did receive it. To the few who could tell the difference. To the disciples who have walked with Jesus and watched the miracle and known the power of God displayed. He gave the right to become children of God. See, the problem was they didn't have any wine. And the provision was Jesus took water and turned it into wine. But the product was an increase in faith for the disciples. Look at verse 11. John makes the comment, This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory And his disciples believed him. The problem, they had no wine. The provision, Jesus makes wine. The product is an increase in faith for his disciples. See, Mary came to Jesus. And all Mary wanted was for him to meet the need of the moment. And Jesus says to her with as much grace and respect yet sincere concern as he can muster, you don't understand. My work isn't just to meet needs like a magician that pulls a rabbit out of a hat. I'm not your ATM. I'm not a pop machine. I'm not here just to meet your every whim. Jesus Christ draws the distinction and forces his mother to understand that his mission is so much bigger than that. His mission is to go to the cross, to give his life in the place of sinners. So everything that he does leading up to that has to serve that purpose. It has to support that mission. It has to extend that cause. So when Jesus tells the servants, go and fill the jars with water and bring them back, and the water is turned into wine, (coughs) he's not simply meeting the need that his mother talked about. But he is serving his broader mission to bring about the obedience of faith in the world. See, Jesus Christ is not indifferent to our needs, but he is insistent that his will be done. When you and I come to Jesus Christ with a need in our lives, we must understand that the meeting of our needs does not center upon our wants, our desires, our temporary circumstance, upon what makes our lives easier. Jesus Christ meeting our needs centers on us having a greater faith. So this morning... If you find yourself in the middle of a long valley, of a difficult journey, if you have come upon hard times, or maybe you have been there before and you cried out to Jesus Christ with your problems, with your circumstances, with your needs like His mother Mary did, and you found that He didn't meet the need in a way that made life easier, that lessened your burden, that took away your difficulty. 
then I want you to understand, dear friend, it is because he is not bent on your pleasure. He's not bent upon your happiness. He is determined to bring about holiness in your life by increasing your faith in him. Jesus said to his mama, what do you want? And she wanted the need met. By the time the story is done, Jesus has met the need, but not in a way that serves the moment, but in a way that opens the door to eternity with him. What do you want, my friend? I hope more than anything, you want Jesus as your Savior.